the difference between a 17 year old sex trafficked child, whether that child is in pornography or on the street, and an 18 year old so called consenting adult is 60 seconds. For parents out there, it is really a, a 10 fire alarm. We cannot hide between this, this really artificial and detrimental separation between adults and, and, and children or so-called adults and children. Thank you so much for being here with us today and giving us some of your time. I have to tell you, the last time I was able to speak with you was at a Coalition to End Sexual Exploitation Summit several years ago. And I think it was one of my favorite interviews we've ever been able to do, but we were so short on time. So I'm so excited to have more time to speak with you today. Oh, no, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be part of this youth movement to end online sexual exploitation and to really make people aware of how, how harmful pornography is. So well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Well, before we jump in too much to kind of some of the specifics, um, do you mind telling our audience, our listeners, a little bit about the breadth of work you have done over these past few decades and kind of how you got involved in this work? Um, yes, it's a, it's a long story because I thankfully I've been around for a very long time. I've been doing this work for about 30 years uh, officially, but um I mean, my background is I'm a first generation New Yorker. My parents came from Haiti. And, uh, you know, I've always had a sense of how important women's rights were, girls' rights, girls' education. My grandmother was a suffragette in Haiti. And so from a very young age, it was very clear to me that I had a responsibility to continue the struggle uh, for equality for women and girls and to obviously use my privilege and, and the education that uh, they sacrificed to give me in order to improve the situation for women and girls and to seek justice um, and equality for all. So, you know, I just went on my merry way until uh, I graduated from, from graduate school in international studies. And then I was traveling with a, a dean from, um, from a graduate school in, in Alabama. And, he said, you should try to go to law school. I was like, law school? No, I want to do a PhD in comparative literature. And lo and behold, I went to law school, after which I was at a Wall Street law firm where I met um, this uh, colleague named Jessica Newworth, who had just come back from Amnesty International or had left Amnesty International, I should say, had started what is now the Women's Rights Division at Amnesty. And this is 1992. So this is before the whole concept of of women's rights or human rights was coined. It was before anything that happened to women and girls because they were born female, such as female genital mutilation or, or prostitution or child marriage or even domestic violence or sexual violence. So Jessica said, we should start an organization that is based on sort of the Amnesty International framework, but just for women and girls. And um, didn't even have a name for it. She said, let's call it Equality Now. So that's a terrible name. <laughs> And so that's how really I started officially as a board member, as a founding board member of Equality Now, which is now the largest international women's rights organization. Um, and we focused on all forms of violence and discrimination against women. And when we wanted to focus on sex trafficking, because the, the issue of sex trafficking is so complex, it's so broad, we're dealing with many, many countries, with complex situations, with organized criminal networks and corruption of governments, et cetera, we thought, what can a tiny organization do to uh, bring awareness about the commercial sexual exploitation and the trafficking of women and girls? And we looked to the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, who at the time was four years old. So Cat W was formed in 1988. And so um, that's how it all started. It's so interesting to hear how you got into this work, and I'm so curious to know how throughout the years that you've been doing this work, what is the evolution of this sexual exploitation looked like? You were just talking about what happened pre-internet, but now with the internet, what is what is the landscape that you're kind of navigating today in the work that you're doing? So people often ask me and my other colleagues who started this work in the late 80s, early 90s, like, how do you compare? 
And there is no comparison really, because when we started our work, it was pre-internet. Uh, the concept of human trafficking wasn't even uh, uh, an established legal term. I mean, yes, there were international conventions on, on trafficking, but there were no US federal laws on trafficking that happened in 2000. The Palermo Protocol, which is the international uh, uh, covenant that defines what human trafficking is, is also um, a 2000 law. And so people really didn't understand what human trafficking was. And even when we started working on the New York State human trafficking law, what the legislators would tell us is, we have rape laws, we have coercion laws, we have kidnapping laws, like why would why would we need a human trafficking? So you had that whole sort of uh, period where there was a lot of education. Um, now with the internet, it's a totally different ball game where I don't think anyone anticipated in 1996 when the Communications Decency Act came and said that basically websites can do anything they want at, at all times with no accountability for third party uh, uh, materials that we would now be in a world where pornography was ubiquitous, that any eight or nine or 10 or 12 year old child with a phone or with a friend who has a computer could have access to pornography. Um, you don't need to go to a sex tour agency to, um, to have a sex tour organized. You just go online and hook up with a local pimp and you could just go and exploit and rape the most vulnerable human beings on the planet who are mostly uh, young women and girls. And so now we are dealing with a situation that is almost, um, I don't wanna say insurmountable because we wouldn't do this work unless we we had the hope that things could change, but right. law enforcement right. cannot keep up with the level of, uh, of uh, sexual exploitation that is happening online, the level of grooming that is happening online. And it's not a situation now that we can um, get out of by prosecuting traffickers or, or pimps or third party exploiters. It really is a, a cultural issue. It's a, it's a cultural war and it's extremely diff difficult to put the, how to say, to put the, the, the horse back in the barn. Where I stand anyway, and I'm sure you feel the same way. It's just, it's, uh, it's almost ground zero when it comes to um, a culture of pornification, of objectification, of commodification, particularly of girls. Why are we in a situation where the fastest growing uh, group of detected trafficking victims are girls, at 23% versus 7% boys? I mean, so much of what you said is so important. A lot of people don't realize how inseparably connected pornography is to all of these, this broader lens of sexual exploitation, right? And as you just mentioned, there are ways people are exploited through pornography. There are ways pornography is teaching people to exploit other people. So can you speak a little bit to first, maybe specifically how people can be exploited in the pornography industry, including people who maybe willingly enter the industry? So I usually like to start with vocabulary, like what does pornography mean? Um, now we now it's become a, a, a synonym to sort of erotic pleasure or sex positivity, which is a term that was coined by the pornography industry itself. People don't really know that. So in the 70s, the people who wanted to promote the sex trade and by sex trade, I mean this multi-billion dollar global industry that includes pornography, prostitution, escorting, sugar dadding, the, the, the works. So pornography literally means taking the word from Greek uh, origins, the depiction of a female slave. So porne means a prostituted woman, uh, an enslaved female in prostitution, and then obviously graphos is its depiction, which is radically different than erotica, which comes from the uh, Roman god of love, Eros. And so now we've combined both. And so people get confused that pornography is something other than um, prostitution on screen. I mean, I think with, of all the survivors I've spoken with, rare are those who didn't say that there was a camera in the room. Um, if you look at who is in pornography, who are the producers, who are the exploiters, they are the same as the pimps and traffickers. You know, quite tragically, uh, this was before my time, but in the 70s when 
feminists were trying to get pornography to be recognized as a, as a civil rights violation against women in particular and failed. And I think if those debates came up now, I think we would probably have better arguments to show. Um, and it's not too late. In your work where you're dealing with prostitution, is pornography used within prostitution often to groom individuals for what a sex buyer wants? Or in what ways is pornography being used on that side of uh, the exploitation of individuals? There's so many levels. I mean, we say pornography is just prostitution on screen. There's really no difference. Um, but what we've been seeing in the last decade, and, and you are probably much more of an expert on this than I am, is sort of the what people call revenge porn, which is a horrible term. But I, I, I think um, the, the ability to film anyone in, in a sexual uh, interaction whether whether the purpose was pornographic or not, then becomes por pornography once you um, once you upload it, and then the whole fear and the coercion and the threats, the ability of of an exploiter to or you know just a friend <laughs> or somebody you thought was your friend to then start uh, blackmailing you. But again, I think I, I think we are now at a crossroads because it is. It's such an epidemic and it has deadly consequences or, you know, lifelong pervasive harmful consequences that um, legislators are starting to think about it. Educators are starting to think about it, not as much as we'd like them to. Um, again, I remember when my sons were in high school, especially my youngest son, and at every PTA meeting, I would bring up the issue of porn when they were in high school because inevitably you always had a boy who would send what was known as dick pics or they would threaten girls um they would take pictures of them and then say if you don't date me i'll i'll hurt you and parents were just not willing to talk about it the educators or the school administrators were not willing to talk about it and um, you know, 20 percent of the boys of that 10th grade class <laughs> were expelled for for something or other um, that had to do with sexual wow. harassment or or threats of sexual violence, and yet there was still this um, this incredible reluctance to talk about the effects of pornography on these children. Um, the Center for Disease Control just came out with a report this week, two days ago, on February 12th or 13th, saying that one in five girls will have experienced sexual violence or has experienced sexual violence, which is an increase of 20% since 2017, and that three in five girls feel persistently sad and hopeless, um, which is an exponential increase uh, from just you know less than 10 years ago. And what the CDC numbers show us is that girls that are at particular risk, because as we know, what pornography teaches um, our kids is for, for girls to learn how to so-called enjoy uh, subordination and, and, and enjoy sexual dominance. And um, for the boys, it's just a very warped sense of how do I exercise my power and, uh, and control over another human being for my sexual pleasure. It's a very, very concerning time for parents of young children to try to navigate um, what is happening right now online and not just online, I mean, in, in Hollywood as well. I think it is so interesting because we do hear from parents who don't know how to address these topics with their kids. But I think the bigger issue we see is the gap in knowledge between what parents think pornography is and what it actually is today or what this exploitative content is today is the, the gap is just getting wider and wider. And you mentioned, quote, revenge pornography. You mentioned a, a sort of, to an extent, sexting or issues that so many schools are dealing with right now. And earlier you spoke a little bit about how pornography is influencing some of these behaviors, but I know a lot of your work focuses on gender-based violence, and can you talk a little bit about how pornography perpetuates this gender-based violence and encourages some of these things to happen? So I, I say if a Martian came down and knew nothing about the sex trade, pornography, prostitution, like nothing, and you showed it just one cartoon, and on one side you'd have 99.9% uh, .9 of sex buyers as men, and then on the other 
99% of the people who are bought and sold uh, are being women and girls. Now, you know, there's a sprinkling of men, boys, you know, transgender and gender nonconforming youth as well. But that cartoon is one side men and one side women. What's wrong with that picture? You don't need to have any type of ideology on anything, but there's, there is, the picture is worth a thousand words, right? If you look at how pornography is portrayed or done or executed, it really is about sexual dominance and sexual violence, primarily uh, by a male figure over a feminized figure, right? A female body. Um, no one talks about sort of the direct medical impact or physical consequences of getting um, triply, you know, penetrated anally, vaginally, orally, uh, how that woman's body is destroyed. I mean, just physically destroyed after three months of filming um, or where this woman came from. Um, and then the, the, the other part is adding to sort of the, the pure, it's pure misogyny is what it is, because what it does is that it reduces uh, women in particular to a commodity that can be consumed with no regard for anything, not her dignity, not her health, not her life story, not the future of, of, of her life, nothing. It's, she's just an absolute object that is um, worse than a doll, actually. So that's that's one aspect of it. And then the, the compounded element of that is the racism in it. You go on Pornhub and it, everything is classified by race or ethnic groups in the worst racist stereotypical ways. Um, and this is aside from sort of the sexist <laughs> uh, attributes. And you just think how, like no other industry would be allowed to define people in the worst uh, racist stereotypes, like none other. When I talk to my colleagues who are uh, working in domestic violence shelters, they will tell you that the the women who come to them will say that their batters watch porn before they beat them, or they beat them because the women couldn't uh, duplicate or replicate what the men just saw on screen in pornography. I think it's very hard when you have shows like Euphoria or <laughs> White Lotus. I mean, the list is long, um, whether it's uh, HBO or Netflix or movie theaters where pornography and prostitution are glorified and mainstreamed. And it gets very, very difficult for sort of the average average person, let alone the, the average adolescent, to figure out what what is it that they're selling me and should I buy it? And if I buy it, why is it that I feel so awful? Um, mentally, physically, psychologically. Um, but I, I, again, I think it's it's up to us and us, you know, the collective <laughs> movement to end sexual exploitation online and off to to really get people to start asking the right questions. I, well said. I think, you know, this world we live in today, there's so much technology around us. There are so many different ways people are being exploited. There are so many different ways that young people are accessing this content and in places it's being normalized. And I think it takes a lot of us to keep educating and raising awareness so that people can make informed decisions because especially young people don't have the information that they need to make these informed decisions, as you've said. So it's only becoming more and more challenging, but I do feel hopeful that we can continue to make some progress. And I guess with that, I want to ask you, what progress have you seen on these issues and what hope could you give to people to know that it is worth continuing to, to do this work and to fight exploitation? You know, CATW is primarily a legal advocacy organization. So we have seen tremendous progress in legislation. Again, as I mentioned before, we can't prosecute ourselves out of this mess. There aren't enough uh, resources to go after every pornographer and every trafficker on the planet. So we have to use other means um, than the law. But I would say, you know, obviously since since I started 30 years ago, we now have strong international laws, strong US federal laws. Practically every state has laws against human trafficking. Um, I know it's a highly, highly controversial 
um, piece of legislation for reasons I don't understand. I mean, I do, but it, they're ridiculous. But there's Hosta Sesta, which is a surgical amendment to the act that I had mentioned before, the Communications and Decency Act. So there's a section called 230 that basically this was in this was passed in 1996 when the internet was first um, born, and so nobody could predict where the internet was going, but it was clear that the internet was going to be an incredible source of revenue and business development. And so website developers did not want um, any liability for third party content. So like if I'm Google and, or if I'm Craigslist and um, you sell to somebody a broken chair or a, a, a bad car, I don't wanna be responsible for it. So, of course, it was the explosion of, of online sexual exploitation and porn because of 230. And so what FOSTA SESTA does, which was passed in 2018, it basically says, yes, internet service providers, you are still not liable for third party content. But if you knowingly promote uh, prostitution and you knowingly facilitate sex trafficking, so very, very narrow, knowingly is a very high standard of evidence in a court of law. But if you do those two things, then you are liable, right? Because you profit from the sexual right. exploitation of others. Um, and so that was the shutdown of Backpage, although Backpage shut down before FOSTA SESTA passed. Right now, if you look up FOSTA SESTA online, it's just pages and pages of misinformation and disinformation. You know, right. it doesn't prevent people from their bodies online. It doesn't prevent people from exchanging information about their so-called clients, et cetera. It, it, it really is a law that should be applied and could be applied to online sugar dating because they knowingly facilitate um, sex trafficking and promote prostitution. <laughs> um, uh, but again, I think the political will sometimes isn't there. So I think from a legal perspective, we have a much better understanding of online sexual exploitation and how to end it. Um, and then I would say the second most hopeful um, phenomenon, because it is a phenomenon, and it, that is the survivor-led movement, which we didn't have 30 years ago, where now it's there's it really is global. There's a strong survivor-led movement in the United States and in Europe. It's growing in in across Africa and Asia and Australia. And I really do believe that the more um, uh, people with lived experiences of sexual exploitation online and off, the better we will understand the the harm. Um, I always say our conversations around prostitution and pornography are what are the conversations we had 40 years ago on domestic violence, where it was a harmful cultural practice. Like men could beat their wives. It was in law. People thought, you know, maybe she should have <laughs> ironed his shirts a little better or cooked a little faster, or whatever it was. And it took 5,000 years for our representatives to understand that this was a crime of power and control and abuse. Um, and I think that's where we have to go with um, prostitution and pornography. I think that's, that's, yeah, that's the road where we're on. It's, it's a long road, but I have great faith in the next generation <laughs> um, in, yeah. in sort of having the right language. It's really like having the right language to communicate with people that uh, this is just unacceptable in, in any society that is, uh, that is seeking to attain equality for all and justice for all and, and to give people tools to reach their full potential as opposed to destroying their lives. And that childhood isn't something that um, you should survive. Like childhood is something in which you should thrive and and, and really grow and become the full human being that, that you're entitled to become. That's well said. And I think, um, I mean, 
for even for someone maybe in our society who isn't personally consuming pornography, I think it's really important to note that pornography is influencing our society and the way our society functions, regardless of whether or not an individual is consuming it. So it really does take all of us um, consumers, former consumers, non-consumers, to address these issues together to make some of this progress. And I'm so grateful as well for all of the survivors in this movement that are leading so many incredible um, initiatives to combat this as well. I think we need those voices. And we've spoken with several survivors, and it uh, can be different for everyone to speak out on these topics. But for those who might be listening, if we have survivors listening, um, could you share any advice you have with someone who might be looking for resources or for help? Well, if they go on our website, uh, Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, I think it's catwinternational.org, we do have a resource page, um, World Without Exploitation, another group that works very closely with survivors, has a great website. There are a number of survivor-led organizations, frontline service providers, whether you're in Massachusetts or Arizona, Texas, um, Nevada, uh, just just look up those those places. There there are amazing survivor leaders who are now frontline service providers who can help. And for someone who's maybe a porn consumer who, after all of the information we've shared today, maybe still isn't convinced that maybe consuming pornography could be harmful to themselves or to others, what kind of what's the most compelling information or advice you think you could share that would convince someone to maybe reconsider? The the fight against pornography has been a feminist fight for decades and decades. And you may remember when, uh, maybe it was a few years ago, when Time Magazine came out on the negative effects of pornography viewing on men. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was a concern, right? Because we're talking about erectile dysfunction and addiction to porn and Keep, um, men losing their jobs because they were watching porn at work or not doing their work, you know, having to separate or getting divorced or because of porn addiction. So I would say, even if it's something that you believe gives you joy and pleasure or whatever else you tell yourself to justify uh, your porn watching, just take care of your health. Like if nothing else, if you don't believe that pornography is a deadly industry, uh, where 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 people, especially women and girls, actually die or are maimed for life, um, then take care of your own health because it is very, very, very bad for your health. Yeah, and that speaks a little bit to how and why so many are calling pornography a public health crisis, right? Do you have any additional thoughts on the way that message is being communicated and why why so many people are kind of raising the alarm about this being a public health crisis? You know, again, the sex trade is so vast and it permeates every aspect of our culture and our lives that it, it really requires a very broad community of thinkers and doers and policymakers, right? So I say it's like this big balloon with many strings and everybody needs to take their string. Our string is really looking at issues of equality and human rights and an end to sexual violence and sexual exploitation from an equality perspective, but equality for women and girls. But I think it's also critically important for um, our, our medical institutions to look at it from a public health perspective, um, you know, our, our, our educators to look at it as, uh, as, as sort of, if you, if you really want to prevent all of the harms that are listed in the CDC report that just came out, then it's important to talk about and the cost to society, right? We don't, we haven't even touched upon the cost to society, the emergency room cost, the absenteeism cost to corporations, um, et cetera. So uh, yeah, it takes a village to uh, raise awareness about the harms of pornography and prostitution. And, and, and we all need to be together and come with our string and come to the table and try to hammer it out until everybody understands what is happening and, and how it's, it's, it's really destroying our society. I mean, if if there was an increase of 60% of, of hopelessness and suicidal ideation and sexual violence among youth, what will it be in another 10 years if we don't address this? I think that's something that we're thinking about all of the time. And I think 
parents and young people, it's starting to catch up, right? These these young people who are experiencing this in a way that no other generation of youth has experienced in the past. I think it's important that we keep fighting and we keep doing this work and uh, we keep asking these questions, you know, what are these larger societal harms to creating and normalizing this content? I think it's really important. Before we wrap up, is there anything else that you wanted to share or any topic you want to cover specifically that you think would be beneficial to our audience that we haven't talked about yet? I would add something on the whole issue of adults and consent, because very often um, when we have these conversations, the responses are, well, adults can do what they want and they seem to enjoy it and they probably consented to this. And we have to be very careful with the ideas of consent or agency when it comes, especially when it comes to sexual exploitation or gender-based violence, right? Because it has always been sort of the term to not deal with something again, you know, domestic violence or sexual violence and rape. It was always around whether or not she had that red skirt. She went to his house. She didn't listen to her husband. Right. So that that is one thing. And then the second thing is the difference between a 17 year old sex trafficked child, whether that child is in pornography or on the street and an 18 year old so-called consenting adult is 60 seconds. And consumers uh, or you know, sex buyers do not care, quite the opposite. So now we find ourselves in a situation where, like if you look at countries that have legalized or decriminalized the sex trade, they have the highest rates of child sex trafficking compared to, com- to countries that have not. Um, when now we talk to federal agents who say, They only have resources to deal with um, child sexual abuse material of toddlers and four-year-olds that they can no longer deal with 12-year-olds or 13-year-olds because they're older kids. I I don't even have words to express sort of the urgency of all of us dealing with the situation because it is so atrocious that what happens when um, we hear about such atrocities is that we shut down. And we pretend that um, it didn't happen or because there's only so much uh, we can take given the the news and the state of the world these days. But for parents out there, it is really a a 10 fire alarm. And um, uh, um, we cannot hide between this, this really artificial and detrimental separation between adults and and children or so-called adults and children. Thank you so much for adding that. And I did want to ask you, with your work focused internationally, do you have difficulty where the age of consent varies um, between countries in some cases regarding these issues? How do you navigate that? Um, Well, I mean, it's a legal question. Even here in the United States, the age of consent varies. At the international level, you know, there's a convention called the Convention on the Rights of the Child, where a child is defined as a person under the age of 18. So any of those laws would violate the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Unfortunately, the United States did not ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child, so we're really the outlier. Um, but you know, we have federal laws that recognize uh, adults and other laws that recognize um, human beings as children until they're 18, and so it would it would not align itself with sort of our understanding of what an adult is. Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, that 60 seconds is a small window. So I think that's really important to note and really well said. So I did want to ask you, um, oftentimes when we talk about sex trafficking happening within the pornography industry, it's really difficult for people to grasp that concept because what they see on a screen looks consensual. We've talked about consent. They believe that it is someone over the age of 18 performers or individuals in these videos sometimes even have to be recorded on video giving verbal consent on video and so for a consumer they believe kind of what they see but based on the legal definition of sex trafficking can you explain to people a little bit how pornography can happen through forced fraud or coercion or an individual under the age of 18 in the porn industry based on that definition when we talk to survivors and these are conversations we had very often during the whole back page craziness. And they would all say like their pimps were right there next to them or their pornographers or their traffickers. And they were the ones like the ones who were being exploited were the technically savvy ones. And so they put up the ads and they refreshed and 
they found new outlets online to make sure that that their traffickers were go- going to profit from from their exploitation. So in order for a prosecutor to prove sex trafficking, they have to show force, fraud, coercion, which is a very high level. And, it, and it's why um, there are so few trafficking convictions, because obviously the force, fraud, and coercion will happen in the first 24 hours or 78 hours, three months down the line, six months, two years down the line, you're already so destroyed and you know, you're traumatic, you could be traumatically bonded with your trafficker, he's the father of your children. I mean, there are many, many reasons that you're still in the situation that does not require any force whatsoever. But there, the actual definition of sex trafficking um, in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act says it's, it's anybody who entices or procures or obtains or patronizes or solicits someone for purposes of a commercial sex act. And, and so, yeah, that's the definition of a pimp. It's the definition of uh, a sex buyer of a trafficked victim. And again, it's not whether or not she consented or whether or not she knew what she was getting into. It really is about who are the driving forces that are making this production happen. Um, and then the other important part, and this is a this is not only in under international law, but also it's a very fundamental human rights principle that no one can consent to their own exploitation. So even if you know what you're getting yourself into, supposedly, right? You know that you're going to sign up to dance in a strip club because, hey, you know, I know how to dance and I've went to a bowl class at Equinox and I'm pretty good at it. What happens to you once you're there um, does not eliminate the harm and the violence and the sexual exploitation that that you are suffering. Your consent is irrelevant. Thank you. I think that was very well said and a very helpful perspective for our audience. You mentioned that sometimes um, when something seems too big, we kind of shut down and, and we pretend it didn't happen. I think that happens a lot in the United States with people thinking, oh, issues of sex trafficking or sexual exploitation just happen in other places, not here. Can you illuminate uh, the situation a little bit, speak to that a little bit for what that really looks like in the United States? The United States is one of the top five largest producers of pornography, if not the top three. The largest number of detected sex trafficking victims in the United States are uh, homegrown U.S.-born kids, mostly girls, and mostly girls of color. So yes, trafficking is an international phenomenon. There's not one country in the world that's not a source, transit, or destination country. Um, But yeah, you don't need to leave your neighborhood or even leave your building to be a victim of trafficking um, or a victim of exploitation or wind up on, on, on a porn site. So yeah, I think I think it's, you know, people have that sort of the Hollywood movie taken or, you know, all those all those movies that show Cambodian people being um you know, tied to a radiator in somebody's basement. But and that happens for sure. It happens, but that is that's not the story of sex trafficking. You know, everybody who's listening to this podcast probably in their town has a so-called massage parlor with red neon lights and strip clubs. And it's it's part of our decor. You know, we don't ask ourselves who's profiting from it, who's being exploited, who's suffering, who's who's gaining sexual pleasure from uh from the from the exploitation of others. We we don't ask ourselves that because I don't know, maybe you can say what could I do, but I, I do think we have gone through a lot of um, periods throughout history where harmful cultural practices were overturned and uh, and dismantled. And I think this could also be one of them. So you've mentioned a few times it's important that we focus on the sex buyers and on the people perpetuating these systems and also profiting from these systems. And I think for anyone who might be questioning the emphasis of of this work on focusing on women and girls as victims. Um, I know you gave the the analogy earlier of if an alien came down and saw victims versus perpetrators, but can you speak a little to why males are the predominant sex buyers in this country and what we know statistically about sex buyers and um, just 
talk a little bit more to that? Mm, well, that's the $50,000 question. But yes, the 99.9%, the or I would say maybe 99% of sex buyers are men, and that's across the board and in every country in the world. Doesn't mean that you don't have women or others who are sex buyers, but that's those are the statistics according to the United Nations. Again, from my, from my perspective, uh, the way I see the world is that the story of patriarchy is the story of prostitution. If you look at, there's a, there's a Dutch law, and there are many, many laws on, on prostitution across Europe and, and elsewhere that kind of show the reason why red light districts and brothels were created, but it was basically to separate uh, the so-called good women from the bad women. So women are seen either, uh, or were seen, and still to some extent are, you know, you're a good girl who becomes a good wife and a good mother, um, or you can not be a good girl. <laughs> You've got one class of women who deserve certain rights. And again, they didn't have rights then, but it's even set in this Dutch law in the 15th century that says that we need to establish a red light district to protect the good women from rape. And so that is the vision that most of our governments had for women who either got raped in the uh, commercial sex industry or you got raped for free. Um, and it goes to, you know, I mean, if you look at the women's movement, which is where I live, uh, it's only been 50 years, uh, 50 years ago. I mean, in, in my lifetime, like my grandmother, she couldn't buy property or have a credit card. Or um, even when I was in law school, there were certain judges that wouldn't allow women to wear pantsuits in court, right? So women are still second class citizens. And we know that once we objectify a particular group, um, once we dehumanize them, once we categorize them as, as second class citizens, then anything can happen to them, right? So, um, and again, as a mother of sons, um, we also traumatize our boys, right? We teach them to dominate. And so how do you undo that? And, and that's a 5,000 year journey, it really is. Um, so, so yeah, so when people say, well, it's happened, you know, prostitution is the oldest profession. First of all, it's not true. Agriculture was, or midwifery was. Um, prostitution is something that was invented for a specific social purpose and to remind society that men controlled and women needed to be controlled. Well, I could ask you questions all day long, I'm quite sure, um, because you have so much wisdom on these topics and and I'm so interested in your perspectives, but I know we're almost out of time. Is there anything else that you wanted to add that you haven't, that we haven't talked about yet? No, I just wanted to thank the youth movement, you know, people like you fight the drug and other youth groups who, who are really on the front lines of this. Cause we don't, our, my generation doesn't have the language and we can't keep up with all of the developments online, on social media, in, um, in, shows and series and all that, that are really, really, really impeding our progress um, toward dignity and yeah, helping people be who they're supposed to be. <laughs> and so I just, uh, it, it, it brings me great joy and hope to see this next generation um, really tackle these, these um, enormous, enormous dilemmas that we weren't facing. We were facing other challenges, but We've never seen anything like it. And so, um, you know, I salute you. We support you. And uh, and thank you so much for all of your frontline work. Well, thank you. I, I think I could speak for all of the youth in this movement when um, I say we're really grateful that so many people care about this issue and have been doing this work um, and are doing this work with us. I think, as you've mentioned several times throughout this, um, it really does take all of us and it takes a, a multifaceted approach to address such severe and significant issues. So thank you so much. I'm sure we'll speak again soon. I hope we speak again soon. Take care. Anytime. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and a non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects, 
using only science, facts, and personal accounts. Check out the episode notes for resources mentioned in this episode. If you find this episode helpful, consider subscribing and leaving a review. Consider Before Consuming is made possible by listeners like you. If you'd like to support Consider Before Consuming, you can make a one-time or recurring donation of any amount at ftnd.org forward slash support. That's ftnd.org forward slash support. Thanks for listening. We invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.